You are wondering about auditory processing. Somewhere along the way in investigating ADHD, you might have also encountered this idea of auditory processing. And you're wondering, what is it? How do I get somebody who could do an evaluation? What does that look like? And what are the red flags that might say that I need to go and find that person? My name is Veronica with ADHD at What Now? It's a Pleasure to have you here and to have Dr. Melissa Karp here with us as well. And she will be talking about this topic. She's an audiologist practicing out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Isn't that right, Melissa? That's right. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here today. Can you start off by sharing a little bit about your background expertise? And if you have ever worked with a child with ADHD and auditory processing, and there was some kind of like, um, like what did it look like in the beginning? What does it look like, at, like after treatment? and just share a story about that to give us some context, please. Sure, I would love to do that. So um, my name's Melissa Karp, I'm an audiologist, and I didn't even know what audiology was until I went to college. So I took a sign language course and it was an elective and I found out that, oh my gosh, there's this whole field of people that work with hearing impairment and helping others hear better. So changed my major and I ended up in grad school at Vanderbilt University. And that was, I was so fortunate to fall into that because I don't think there's anywhere else that I could have gotten that amount of mentors and the diversity of patients. And I mean, these are things that so many students don't get that opportunity for. And that was really my first introduction to APD. Uh, once I got out of school, and I got into real world audiology, it was a shock. And, you know, it, in the real world, we don't have unlimited time and we don't have unlimited resources. And it got very, I, I mean, I was really frustrated and, and kind of disenchanted with not being able to provide the care that I thought was, was necessary. And I went out on my own and started to practice to do that. And, you know, super scary to do that. But five years later, focusing on APD, I've had to hire employees. I've had to hire another audiologist and I've built great relationships with um, different specialists to refer back and forth to. So I think we're really making some inroads in North Carolina with, with APD. Um, you know, and I know that your focus is really ADHD. And those two things can truly overlap. I see a lot of kids with ADHD. And I would say that by the time a parent gets to me, they have had a lot of frustration and a lot of searching. And most kids have already had different evaluations, whether it's been with a psychologist or a speech pathologist or a neurologist. And they may have a diagnosis of ADHD in place. They may have medication. They may not have medication. They may be questioning their diagnosis. And you know, the, the fact is that the conditions can overlap. So when I was thinking about talking with you, there's, there's a patient that really comes to mind that I'd, I'd love to kind of share. Um, he's, he's one of my rock stars, but he was a little guy. His name's Dylan eight years old. Uh, he started coming here in November and already diagnosed with ADHD, an immune deficiency, learning disabilities. He had articulation errors that were treatment resistant. Um, and he was actually dismissed from speech therapy because he just couldn't hear the difference between the sounds he wasn't making progress. And we, we later found out like during the course of treatment, he was then diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. I mean, he couldn't follow multi-step directions. He couldn't hear the difference between different musical instruments. He was really slow to respond. He misunderstood a lot, constantly saying what and huh. And his mother just said, well, maybe it's something with his hearing. Hearing test came back normal. And then she said, well, maybe it's APD. And so he came in and yeah, he, he absolutely had difficulties with decoder, decoding uh, tolerance fading memory, which is a combination of, um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a combination of auditory memory and speech and noise. He had difficulty with 
temporal processing. He couldn't, again, he couldn't hear the differences in different pitches and tones, whether it was speech or music. And his ADHD didn't impact the testing at all. So once we had that in place, we started him with some oral rehab therapy and we worked with phonemic training. We worked with words and noise. We worked with metacognition. He came in once a week for five months, but truly his family was amazing because everything that we did, they reinforced at home. He worked with some game-based apps to fill in some of those other skills. Five months later, I reevaluated him in March. He no longer met the criterion for that diagnosis of APD. I mean, total rock star. Um, his articulation, he could hear the difference between the sounds, like he could hear a s and sh, and he could actually produce them because he could hear the difference. We got him following three auditory step directions consistently. He could blend, he could rhyme, he could complete those temporal processing tests right within normal limits. He could carry on a conversation. I mean, he blossomed and it was incredible. So this was a kid that couldn't learn in a regular classroom. He was homeschooled. And now they're looking at, you know, with, with COVID restrictions easing of this, this kid going back to school. So it, it, it can be life-changing. That's amazing. What a story. Yeah. Wow. So then what is auditory processing disorder? I think you like highlighted some of the red flags a little bit just in, in, in that sharing his story, but what is auditory processing? What does it mean? Sure. So auditory processing disorder is what the brain does with what it hears. So anyone can pass that test where you listen for the beeps and you raise your hand, but auditory processing looks at what is the brain actually doing with those sounds? So it's not, is there a sensitivity issue? It's what's actually happening. So I like to say that the ears collect, but the brain connects. And that's a really important part of it. We hear with our ears and our brain. So when we talk about auditory processing disorder, people hearing the sensitivity is normal, but they may have difficulty hearing and understanding the differences in speech sound. They may have difficulty hearing in noise. They may have difficulty hearing from both sides and separating out information, or they may have temporal difficulties. And that would be, you know, hearing that melody and understanding speech, like the difference between an inside voice and an outside voice, or a question, a statement, is something sarcasm or not. And so that, that's what auditory processing is in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there really an association between um, auditory processing and ADHD? Like, do they, tip it, do they often go together? Are there statistics around that? Well, I see a lot of patients with both, but they can look very similar. So it can be more difficult sometimes to tease out what is actually going on. Mm -hmm. So when I think about APD and ADHD, a lot of acronyms here, um, a person with either one, you know, might struggle to focus when they're in a noisy place. They can fidget or seem distracted. Uh, they can have difficulty following directions. They can be scoring below grade level in academics. They can look like they're zoning out, but there's a different reason for that. So someone with ADHD, it's more the differences in the neural pathways and the neurotransmitters. With APD, it's because the world around sounds kind of foggy or unclear. So sort of like learning through a bad cell phone connection. So even though they can coexist, there's, there's some subtle differences that you can, can look at. Um, for someone with just ADHD, they may have those difficulties in every environment, whereas someone with APD is going to do a little bit better in a quiet environment. Um, if I actually do testing for APD, the individual with ADHD is just going to have no pattern whatsoever on the tests. Everything's going to be impacted because with ADHD, it's a global brain condition, whereas with APD, it's more process specific and I can actually find patterns of weakness and areas of strength if I'm just looking at APD. Um, and, and also when you think about what's the primary complaint with ADHD, it's usually primarily, well, they're inattentive or they're hyperactive. And with APD, it's usually the primary complaint is there's poor listening skills. So looking at some of those, those subtle differences helps 
figure out and differentiate between the two, but got an awful lot of kids with both. <laughs> Makes sense. Do you think auditory processing disorder is often missed? Like, I think it can be. I think that sometimes it's really easy to take a child who has attention deficits and blame everything on that. And we know that that's not the case. And I've seen plenty of individuals who've been diagnosed with ADHD and medication and traditional behavioral therapies not helping, they're still having difficulties. But once we start working with auditory processing, it's just, it's another layer. It's peeling an onion. There's so many different layers to these kids that, you know, you have to figure out what are the basic skills and go from there. Because regardless of whether or not there's something global with attention, it doesn't preclude having an auditory processing disorder. So making sure that we rule all of those things out is important if there's difficulties with attending and listening in a classroom. Mm -hmm. All right, great. So let's pretend that I'm a parent, I'm just hearing this, and now I'm wondering what do I do next, right? Like if I want to pursue this, how do I locate an audiologist who can do an auditory processing evaluation? Can okay. any audiologist do it or do you specialize in auditory processing? Yeah, so I love this question. This is a great question because it really brings up kind of two points. One is that you wanna find an audiologist because only an audiologist can diagnose APD. We're the only profession that it's in our scope of practice. So not a psychologist, psychiatrist, ENT, neurologist, speech pathologist, only an audiologist can diagnose APD. Um, the other thing I like that you asked was that, does it have to be a special audiologist? And, and yes, the person has to be really well-versed in auditory processing disorder and how to evaluate and treat it. Um, not every audiologist does the same thing. You know, APD is my jam, but if you came to me about cochlear implants or vestibular, I'd have to refer you on. So yeah, it, it is something that there's extra training and there has to be different tools at their disposal to work with. So how to find them. So, you know, that I'm, I'm in North Carolina. Our state association has a great website that you can go on. You can put in what specialty you're looking for and it will help you find an audiologist that does that. So checking out your state um, audiology association is one thing you can do. Um, the American Academy of Audiology has a website and they have a find an audiologist feature you can do the same thing there. You can put in auditory processing disorder as a specialty, and it will come up with a state-specific list of who's in your area, your community that you can contact. And there's also another website called APD Support, and there's a really nice map of providers who have further training, and they have who does evaluation, who does treatment, who does both, and that's an international map. So between those different resources, you should be able to find someone. Awesome. We'll link to all of those then in the in the ship, in the notes below. Great. So then once you go there, you identify some practitioners, maybe you call around and, and find um, you know insurance and payment and all that, figure out what works for you. Right. Then what would you expect as part of the evaluation? What would that look like in general? So typically you go in, you you get a hearing evaluation, a full hearing evaluation. So making sure that Yep, they are hearing all of the sounds that they need to hear, making sure that the acoustic reflex is intact. And then it's going into the booth, which is a really, it's a nice quiet place, wearing headphones and it's listening and repeating different types of stimuli. So they're going to hear different words. They're gonna hear words and noise. They're gonna hear sentences. They're gonna hear numbers coming into both ears because we want some stimuli that aren't language dependent because we're trying to pull out what's the difference between auditory processing and language processing. Um, there's gonna be auditory memory testing, usually an attention screening. Um, I screen every kid that comes in for attention so that I've got a good idea. Can they maintain their auditory attention for how many minutes? So I know that I can do my test battery in such a way that it makes sense. If someone can only attend for five minutes, then we need to take breaks. I wanna see if they can do the process, not if it's an attention issue. Um, most audiologists won't give you the results at that first visit. They need time to 
take time, compare it to norms, create a report, create recommendations. So usually you're looking at at least a second visit to get your results. But yeah, that, that's it. You don't have to read anything. You just have to repeat information and, and listen. Now I've heard some different things about the age. Like, um, is there a certain age generally that you would like the child to be, or is there some flexibility inside of that? Yeah, there, there's some flexibility, but we have to work with where do we have normative data? So in our practice, we start screening at four years old. So that's gonna vary depending on, on who you go to and what their comfort level is. So I won't give a diagnosis before seven typically, Mm -hmm. just because I don't feel like I have enough and there's still so much maturation going on. But by four, there's enough testing available that I can say, oh, wow, we, we definitely have, you know, we're, we're below age expectations in these areas. There's some weak areas. Let's start intervening and start working on those areas, get that early intervention in place so that, you know, we're not wasting time. We all know that early intervention is such a big deal. The quicker we can get in there, the quicker we can work with it, the better the outcomes. So, you know, definitely starting to look at this by age four, by seven, I can actually get a full diagnostic evaluation and I test all the way up through adults. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's not too late. It's easier when they're younger, but it, it's not too late. We have a lot of adults come in too. It just perhaps takes more time. Yeah. I mean, it, like, like anything or like learning a new language. You know, children just soak it up. They're sponges. They're, they're in that really great neuroplasticity age. And when we get older, it takes a little bit more time to, to get where we need to be. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So then once you have it, um, or once you decide to intervene, right, mm -hmm. what does that potentially look like coming to see you and you do some treatment and is there some, some support you alluded to that perhaps you could do at home as well? Right. So depending on what is the type of APD, because it's not just, do you have APD or not? There's actually different types of deficits. So treatment has to be deficit specific. Um, you know, when you see these lists of suggestions that are given out for every type of APD, they kind of make me cringe a little bit because there's certain types of APD that, you know, giving a whole lot of information, for example, you know, making sure that they've got visual and auditory and kinesthetic all at the same time is great for decoding, but for someone that's got an integration problem, that actually makes it worse. So mm -hmm. making sure you know where the deficits are to figure out the intervention is really important. Uh, there's a great book called uh, When the Brain Can't Hear, Terry Bellis, great read. She really has some nice lists in there if parents wanna look at things at home once they've been diagnosed and they're very deficit specific. You know, for some kids we'll do we'll do in-office phonemic training, or we'll do different training on the computer for dichotic listening, or we'll do treatment um, with headphones and different sounds for spatial listening difficulties. So there's, there's a lot of things that are out there, but it has to match the deficit. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really hard when you just throw everything at the wall to see what sticks. You really wanna find out what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you for it. Yeah, so sometimes it's in office, sometimes it's home, sometimes it's a combination. Mm -hmm. Do you like, I've heard of computer programs that are supposed to address it. What do you think about those? I think that for certain deficits, they're great. Okay. So there are certain programs that work with spatial listening deficits. Great program. Um, there are some that work with dichotic listening. They do a really nice job. And I've, I've tried tons and tons of these programs. There are other programs that just, they're great as an adjunct, but they don't replace that one-on-one -on -one and they don't replace the therapist. So for example, with some of our kids, we might send home something that works with multi-step directions. Well, that's great. If they're gonna be having screen time anyway, let's work on some of those skills, but it's not the same as a parent sitting down and working with their child or having that one-to-one -one interaction. It, it's just, it's not, it's better than nothing, but, you know, giving that one-on-one -on -one attention and that therapeutic relationship, it's just, it's so much better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. So I think you've given an amazing summary and how to from like beginning to end. And I appreciate that so much. Is there anything else that you would want to say to 
parents and families as they're looking into this area? Um, yeah, I would say that parent intuition is a real thing. And if you feel like your child is having listening deficits and you're concerned about auditory processing, I would absolutely call and have an evaluation. And, you know, even if it's okay, we've ruled this out. We have people come in and we, we don't do a full evaluation. We say, oh, wow, you know, look at this. They really didn't pass their attention screening. This is something you need to look at first. Or we might say, oh, you know, this is really much more language. This is where you need to go. I think your audiologist can be a really good point person because we're trained, we understand what are all of the different things that go into listening and what's behind the scenes with listening. It's not just the ears. So even if it's not auditory processing, you really wanna find a professional that can sit with you and listen to your concerns and, and help point you at least in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely second that. I've been so thankful so many times when um, a specialist has been able to identify or explain exactly what, like, why the behavior that I'm seeing is the behavior that I'm seeing, right? Like right. there's a reason behind it and getting that explanation just helps me understand so much more. And I, I've loved it when every time that's happened, it's been so valuable. Yeah, there are some great professionals out there all over. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not in North Carolina, you can find someone that's awesome. <laughs> Well, if you're willing, will you share it with us the name of your practice for anybody who happens to be in North Carolina? Absolutely. So um, we're Audiology and Hearing Services of Charlotte and our website is audiologycharlotte.com. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. So that's Facebook backsplash, backsplash, back. All links. I'll send you, I'll put all the links down below too. Perfect. Oh, what was it? Facebook.com backslash audiology Charlotte or Instagram. It's audiology underscore Charlotte underscore NC. Awesome. So thank you, Dr. Karp, for having been here today. It's been a true pleasure to speak with you and um, just thank you for sharing. Oh, thank you. And it was great to get a chance to talk to you. I hope it was helpful. And, you know, I, I hope that people get answers. Yes, absolutely. That's why we're here, right? Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.